Last week, the 49ers won to stay atop the NFC West, but the Oakland Raiders, whose victory over Kansas City last week gave them the AFC Western title. Let's take a look at those two Western powers right now. Last week, the San Francisco 49ers traveled to New Orleans, where they met the troublesome Saints. It was an important game for the 49ers, and they started out as though they had a case of the big game jitters. Number 18, Gene Washington, dropped this sure touchdown, but it was the last time that happened all afternoon. Quarterback John Brody showed that he had confidence in his fine young receiver and went right back to him to make it 7-0. But the Saints were loose, and in a game that meant little to them, they scrambled and gambled and won the gamble on a 46-yarder to number 46, Dan Abramowitz. Then number 17, quarterback Billy Kilmer came right back and hit a flying Al Dodd to put New Orleans ahead 14-7. Brody countered by throwing to running back Ken Willard, number 40. But when Willard failed to take it in on two attempts from the one, Brody was forced to go to his quick runners. And although his running game looked good, Brody had an even more surefire method. Gene Washington has come a long way in a short time. In only his second year, he seems headed for superstardom. But even more than that, he's the kind of receiver that John Brody can go to in any situation. And so it was that a balding quarterback and a high-balling receiver made last Sunday less than heavenly for the Saints. And even a last-ditch rally on a Kilmer to Abramowitz pass was wasted. Because no sooner were the Saints driving to get back in the game when a missed field goal by Tom Dempsey was fielded by Bruce Taylor, number 44, who streamed 92 yards to wrap it up for the 49ers, 38 to 27. And the 49er victory, coupled with the Rams' loss to Detroit last Monday, left San Francisco alone at the top in the NFC West. This is the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum. But last week for the Chiefs and the Raiders, it was the OK Corral. For it was where they met in the showdown to decide the AFC's Western champion. The highly touted Kansas City defense struck early. This interception by number 51, Jim Lynch, led to a field goal by Jan Stenerud. In the first half, it was a typical Raider Chief struggle in which battering defenses kept the point totals low. Quarterback Darrell LaMonica finally found the key in number 25, Fred Blitnikoff, who's going one-on-one -on -one against Kansas City's Jim Marsalis. But in the end zone, Marsalis, number 40, was as tough as rawhide. And the Raiders only led at the half on two George Blanda field goals Six to three. In the second half, Oakland began to roll on the powerful legs of Marv Hubbard, number 44. The 
Raiders offensive line blew open huge holes for Hubbard and after his score Oakland led 13 to 6. And the Oakland fans owed their happiness to some unsung offensive linemen named Shell, Upshaw, Otto, Harvey and Shue. While the Oakland defense earned some plaudits also, the last cheers of the day were due Daryl LaMonica and Fred Belitnikoff. They finally managed to team up and beat Jim Marsalis for a touchdown. The jubilant Raiders had won the shootout 20 to six, and by doing so, they became top gun in the AFC West, and perhaps even more important, they finally played a game that didn't take a miracle to win. You know, Tom, 10 or 15 years ago, it used to be accepted that a college quarterback who was coming into the pros would have to serve sort of a four or five year apprenticeship before he'd be ready to, to run a pro offense. But I think that's all changed now because the colleges are running their offenses and have constructed their offense, so they're much more closely associated with the pros. Take a guy like Dennis Shaw at Buffalo in the year he's having at San Diego State. I know they ran a, a pro-type offense. So I think they're coming out ready now. I think they're better af athletes than they were 10 or 15 years ago. But take a guy like, uh, like Stanford's Jim Plunkett, mm -hmm. who looks like he might be one of the top draft choices in next year's draft or this year's draft. He not only has had the benefit of great coaching and a pro-type offense from his head coach, John Ralston, he's been exposed to former San Francisco 49er head coach, Jack Christensen. So he'll know how to read defenses. Uh, he'll be thoroughly familiar with what the pros are doing when he comes into the pros. He ought to be ready right now, don't you think? And Pat, they also put in the air more. Uh, Hickson down at SMU, I think he's thrown more in his senior year than maybe Van Brocklin did in three years at Oregon. And and Jurgensen, of course, came into this league as a split T quarterback, so he had to sit just to find out what that pro, pro system was all about. If he right. could have started off uh, with a, the kind of training that a Plunkett has, say, there wouldn't be any other name in the record books but Jurgensen. Oh, that's right. What's next, Tom? Well, Pat, last week the Steelers lost to Atlanta, and that finally finished their playoff hopes for this year. But at the same time, the Bengals were winning to give them the best shot at the AFC Central title. The Bengals traveled to the Astrodome knowing that coupled with Cleveland's loss to Dallas the day before, wins in their last two games would give the AFC Central crown to Cincinnati. Zeke Moore caught the Bengals possibly thinking ahead to next week when he returned the opening kickoff 45 yards. But the Oilers squandered the good field position when Mack Hike tried one too many moves and fumbled. The Oilers managed two field goals in the first half, and Moore provided a touchdown when he raced 90 yards down the sideline with a Virgil Carter pass.
Unfortunately for Moore and the Oilers, a roughing the passer penalty nullified the play. Although less spectacular, the Bengals' ball control drive set up two field goals, too. The running of Jess Phillips, number 30, and Paul Robinson, number 18, accounted for much of the yardage. In a more wide-open second half, the Oilers put two touchdowns on the board on passes from Jerry Rome to Charlie Joyner. But the two scores were offset by Essex Johnson's pair of six-pointers. Johnson first tore through the Oiler line for 15 yards and then snared a 51-yard strike from Carter. The touchdown difference in the 30-20 score was provided by the Bengal defense. Hike fumbled again, and number 58, Al Beauchamp, raced 25 yards with the bobble. The touchdown helped wrap up Cincinnati's sixth straight win and gave the Bengals a chance to clinch their first division title with a win over Boston this week. In Atlanta, the Steelers needed a win to stay one game behind the Bengals and keep their fading title chances alive as they faced the Falcons, a team with nothing to lose but pride. Pittsburgh started rather slowly as Terry Hanratty's pass on the first play from scrimmage was intercepted by Ken Reeves. The play set up Randy Johnson's pass to Art Malone and a quick 7-0 lead. It was the first score in a game in which the lead would change hands four times. The Falcon touchdown was offset by John Fuqua's 10-yard rumble, but a missed extra point left the Steelers trailing by one. They got that one and two more when Andy Russell's interception set up a field goal. Following a field goal that put the Falcons back on top, the Steelers regained the lead when Mel Blunt raced 70 yards with a kickoff. The run set up Fuqua's second touchdown, a six-incher. From that point on, the Falcon defense shut off the Steeler runners and forced Pittsburgh to throw. John Zook caught one of Terry Bradshaw's throws and plotted to the 12-yard line. The third of five Falcon interceptions set up Jim Mitchell's end-around touchdown. Mitchell's run gave the Falcons a go-ahead touchdown as he just reached the end zone, although some people didn't quite see it that way. last Atlanta score was the result of the efforts of their offense. Harmon Wages skittered 40 yards to start the drive, and Johnson and Paul flatly finished it on an 18-yard hookup. The 27-16 victory was a peak in the Falcons' up-and-down season, but it marked the end of the line for the Steelers' 1970 title hopes.
With only this week left, just a half game separates three teams in the NFC East. While the Giants continued to confound the experts by romping the Cardinals, the Dallas Cowboys mixed in a dash of newfound luck with some old-fashioned defensive muscle to squeeze by the Cleveland Browns. In Cleveland, both the Cowboys and Browns faced the fact that a loss meant almost certain elimination for a playoff berth. A rain-muddied field made almost routine plays hazardous. The quagmire induced both teams to engage in a soggy theater of the absurd. The slippery ball made catches by both receiver and defender almost impossible and once gave number 34 Mike Howell a chance to do his imitation of a waterlogged whippoorwill in flight. To end his act, Howell exited stage left with the latest dance step, the combination secondary stomp and goose step. With it all, Cleveland took an early 2-0 lead when Bob Hayes misplayed a punt, then compounded his misfortune by being trapped in the end zone for a safety. For the second straight game, the Cowboys' defense, led by their all-pro tackle Bob Lilly, number 74, did not allow a point. Although double, triple, and even quadruple teamed, Lilly usually managed to get a piece of Cleveland quarterback Bill Nelson. Though Cleveland owned all the statistics, Dallas dominated them and a big play was really needed. At times, Bill Nelson led Dallas a merry chase. He was superb in the goo and passed for over 300 yards. But once inside of the Dallas goal, Cleveland seemed to come apart. Once with a fourth and one at the Cowboy 11, the Browns disdained three points and came away with nothing. Another time, Cleveland receiver Gary Collins interfered with cornerback Herb Batterly, and a penalty denied the Browns a score. But the biggest play of the game occurred in the fourth quarter when Nelson's connection with Collins was spoiled by a fumble that was alertly recovered by Chuck Howley in the Cowboys' end zone. Dallas combined their luck with two Mike Clark field goals and defeated Cleveland 6-2. For the Browns, the final seconds told the probable end of a long, disappointing season. In St. Louis, the New York Giants, joyriding a season-long crest of emotion, crushed the Cardinals for the second time this year. The Giant victory was a total one as the Cardinals collapsed completely in sight of their first title in 22 years. Only twice did St. Louis display their awesome offense. Once quarterback Jim Hart burned New York with a 79-yard screen to MacArthur Lane. The Cardinals' only other touchdown resulted from the sheer individual brilliance and tenacity of tight end Jackie Smith. But for most of the game, the giant defenders expertly shadowed and shut off the excellent St. Louis receivers. New York coupled their grudging defense with a diversified attack, featuring the pad-popping runs of Ron Johnson and number 24, Tucker Fredrickson. But star status was reserved for quarterback Fran Tarkenton who shredded one of the most expert deep defenses in football. In their first meeting, Fran wisely used tight end Bob Tucker, number 38, to molest the middle of the St. Louis secondary. Once again, Tucker's crossing patterns confused St. Louis, and he scored the first giant touchdown. Tarkenton's uncanny ability to scramble free from trouble often cooled down the Cardinals' rush and the artful Dodger showed that he still retained his gift for improvisation.
His knack for the ad-lib play is filtered down to his teammates as a Tucker lateral to number 85, Don Herman, resulted in a second giant score. Another deft bit of deception by Tarkenton had St. Louis converging into the middle while Fran scampered untouched into the Cardinal end zone. Tarkenton capped his most important and satisfying day by connecting with setback Ron Johnson for the six points that completely put the game out of reach. Then the fun began. Cardinal wide receiver John Gilliam, number 44, thought he would test the jaw of number 20, Scott Eaton, and executed the best hit and run since the days of Jackie Robinson and Pee Wee Reese. For Gilliam and St. Louis, they not only lost the war, they lost the battle too. When all the cleats and helmets were finally sorted out, the Giants claimed a 34-17 victory and a first place tie in the NFC East. For head coach Charlie Winner and the Cardinals, it was possibly the last mile, the end of the road for 1970. Well, I've got to admit, Pat, uh, you said the Giants were a mysterious team, but they're also a good club. I saw them beat the Cardinals, and they really played good football. Yes, they did. And they got another big game coming up this week against the Rams at Yankee mm. Stadium. Well, tell me this now, Pat. Playing in New York, is that a big factor? Or will this give the Giants an edge a little bit? I think it takes some getting used to. You've played there many times yourself, and I think you'll agree that it does. There's nothing like a giant crowd, right? I'll go with the Rams. I like the Giants, uh, mystery or no. I still think they've got a good football team and they've got a lot of that old magic word momentum. Okay, how about out west in the Battle of the Bay, Oakland against San Francisco? Well, I like the 49ers. I've been with them like uh, six games now, so I gotta stick with them. I'll go with George Blanda and the amazing Raiders, okay? <laughs> okay, Tom. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall, and we'll see you next week. This Week in Pro Football has been brought to you by American Motors and your local American Motors dealer. By Hager Slacks, they just fit better naturally. Promotional consideration is provided by American Motors, makers of the bold new 1971 Javelin, with styling so hairy we even risk turning some people off. Javelin by American Motors. Sports fans, don't miss the Sporting Guide. It's on sale now at newsstands everywhere. This has been a color feature presentation in cooperation with NFL Films through the facilities of Hughes Sports Network.